gentlemen. Uh, very pleased here to be here with all of you and particularly a formidable uh, team of colleagues here to present Vedanta's limited fourth quarter <coughs> and full year 2019 earnings. Before we go into the slideshow, if I can start putting out some highlights. Safety is something which is very close to our heart. Very pleased to say that we had a fatality-free fourth quarter across our business. Our work in the area of our work in the area of environment, sustainability, and community progressed further during the quarter, and you will see that in some of the slides in the presentation. Our operating and financial performance was stronger in the fourth quarter when compared to the third quarter, as guided on volume, cost, margins, and even profit after tax. Our zinc underground production went up 29% year-on-year at Hindustan Zinc, and lead went up by about 18%. And bear in mind that Hindustan Zinc, first year of full underground operations, and having had some mining background myself, the ramp up in underground has been truly spectacular. We commissioned our Harmsburg mine in South Africa, which is currently ramping up. A not well appreciated commodity within our portfolio, because we don't take credit for that in our cost, is silver. We achieved record production, and it was up 22% year-on-year, close to producing around 700 tons, and that took us to being a top 10 global silver producer. And with the growth trajectory, we will be reaching top three gold silver producers in the world. And this is the first time a company in India has reached the top 10 league of silver producers. Our oil and gas production was up 2%. Turning to our aluminium business, our alumina production increased 24% year-on-year. Our aluminium production rose 17% thanks to our interventions. And the cost of production in the fourth quarter fell below $1,800 a ton. And I remember in the first two calls we had, the debate was how soon can we get the cost below 2000 We are at below $1,800 a ton. The turnaround in our electro-steel business is evident by a 17% increase in steel production and more than doubling of EBITDA per ton when you compare it to last year. Profit after tax in the fourth quarter was up 6% as compared to the same quarter last year. Our growth projects in the key businesses are tracking very well, and capital expenditure was within guided range, showing the strict control we have in capital allocation. It's all about land positions and resource. We grew our resource base across our key businesses. We continue to deliver industry-leading dividends whilst maintaining a strong balance sheet thanks to our strict capital allocation. In fact, businesses have to earn their money before they spend it. And there is more to come in each of the businesses next year and beyond. Now turning to the commodity markets, the commodity prices show a downward trend in the first half of last year, reflecting concerns around global growth, especially due to trade tensions between U.S. and China, but we saw a rebound in the first calendar quarter of 2019. The rebound and the increase therein reflected supply concerns, progress in trade negotiations between U.S. and China, and the fiscal stimulus in China. We expect the prices to remain volatile, but with an upside potential, from the possibility of tighter-than-expected environmental policies, slower-than-expected easing of commodity-specific supply bottlenecks. Oil prices have also risen since the start of the year amidst production cut by OPEC and other producers and supply disruptions elsewhere in the world. With that overview, let me go into our performance for the year and starting with safety and sustainability. Whilst we had a fatality-free quarter, this unfortunately came on the back of nine previously reported accidents, which is regrettable. Zero harm for us is a continuous journey and we have embarked on further strengthening our safety processes and ensuring that safety of all of our employees and our business partners and contractors is the first priority above anything else. What we are targeting is safe production. In this regard, we are focusing on three specific catalysts in our commitment to zero harm. Firstly, visible felt leadership, where the expectation is that leaders and support personnel spend quality time in the field performing safety interactions, workplace hazard reviews, making proactive hands-on safety interventions to create a culture of care. Once you have a culture of care, safety 
is automatic and a safe operation is the most productive operation. Second, manage safety critical tasks well, where the expectation is that the safety critical tasks are identified, critical competencies and controls are documented clearly in our statement of operating procedures, and the task leader verifies that these are in place every time before a work task is initiated. And the third important catalyst, given our outsource model, is around business partner engagement. Ensure that our business partners, from their CEO downwards, are committed to zero harm, and we treat them as employees for the purposes of safety. Looking at our environment, energy, and water management initiatives, savings and recycling, all of which remain a focus area. We reduced our energy consumption by 1.3 million gigajoules and water consumption by 2.4 million cubic meters. We are also happy with the progress we are making on the greenhouse gas emissions intensity, which was lower by about 17%, well ahead of our target of reaching 16% reduction by 2020 against a 2012 baseline. Our many sustainable initiatives are driven by a fundamental approach of converting waste to wealth. The company recycled 93% of high volume, low effect waste. At Hindustan Zinc, we use 60% of our tailings as space fills for void replacement in our underground mines. We also used an old tailings dam and waste pit to install 38 megawatts of solar farm energy. Turning to corporate social responsibility, as a responsible corporate citizen, besides the many environmental initiatives, we continue to positively impact the local communities we are connected with. And here the focus is children and women. We are happy to share that we opened the 500 Nandgar last quarter. Our sports initiatives, including football academies, are a great way to identify and develop young talent and instill a sense of discipline and self-worth in the youngsters we train. We opened a 350-bed, state-of-the-art medical center in Raipur, the only specialty hospital in central India, and it's treated more than 4,000 patients to date. These are just few illustrations, and for the year in question, our CSR spend on a consolidated basis was 309 crores, which is around 3% of our profit after tax. In the last few years, our businesses have been driving technology projects, to not, improve, not only improve productivity and efficiency, but also using it to develop safe and sustainable processes. And there are a number of examples of it. For example, at Harmsburg, I'm sure some of you have actually been to the site, the team uses state-of-the-art collision awareness system to prevent accidents. Our SK mine, the most advanced in our Hindustan zinc portfolio, we are proud to have developed automated machines for continuous mining and remote control LHD for overhauling purposes. We have some of the most modern enhanced oil recovery programs being implemented or piloted at our oil fields at Bahamar. Let me take this opportunity to state again that Vedanta is uniquely positioned as one of the largest diversified natural resource businesses in the world. We are a significant player in the commodities that we, pres we are present in, and each of the commodities have a leading global demand. Our businesses benefit from abundant mineral resources that India and Africa have to offer. And it is with pride we share that we are a significant contributor to some of these reserves. Of the zinc reserves, our Zinc India business contributes to more than 70%. Similarly, we have a 25% share in our 4.5 barrels of oil reserves in India, and you can imagine our contribution to the silver reserves of the country. We account for virtually 95 to 98%. These are all set to grow over time. And so there's more, no more exciting economy in the world than our own here in India, as the economy remains one of the fastest growing, supported by strong macroeconomic fundamentals. If we combine the enormous economic growth potential of our country, Together with vast, untapped, and underexplored resources, this provides us with a massive opportunity. The substantially low per capita consumption of key metals presents Vedanta with a unique opportunity to provide the vital commodities the country needs. Against this backdrop, 
We are naturally pleased to see a renewed focus by the government on the mining sector as an engine of economic growth. Its natural, national mining policy, NMP launched during the year, aims to increase mineral production by over 200% and to reduce India's trade deficit in minerals by 50% in the next seven years. NMP introduces a more effective and meaningful policy with more transparency and better regulation enforcement. A pro-inclusive growth ambition of any country needs to require, requires a pro-business environment and the NMP will encourage private sector participation in exploration, development, and production. We have offered our suggestions to the high-level committee appointed by Niti Ayo in its deliberations on a new pathway for regulatory framework for mining. In a similar vein, we welcome the landmark policy reforms in the oil and gas sector amidst raising domestic output, cutting imports, whilst also providing a smooth transition to cleaner fuels. And therefore, it is exciting to see that we have a strong pipeline across our businesses to capture the opportunities available to us. All the projects are stress-tested to deliver at least 20% plus returns of conservative commodity price assumptions. The medium-term brownfields opportunities in our business are as follows. If you look at Hindustan Zinc, we are expanding to reach target capacity of 1.2 million tons per annum this year moving to 1.35 million tons in the next phase and eventually to 1.5 million tons. With Zinc International at Harmsburg, we target to achieve 250,000 tons capacity in the first phase, moving up to 450 in the second phase and then eventually to 650. So you can imagine the scale of Zinc International as a percentage of Hindustan Zinc's production. It's close to 50 to 60 percent of it. Growth projects in oil and gas continue to progress well to enhance the production volumes in pursuit of our vision to contribute around 50% of India's crude oil production. In aluminium, the ramp up of our last line in Jasagoda to take to production capacity to 2.3 million tons is in progress, supported by ramp up of captive alumina production, and that eventually wraps up to 2.7 and then 4, with the final objective of 3 million tons integrated aluminium production for the business. On steel, we are aiming to achieve hot metal production of 1.5 million tons this year, rising to around 2.5 to 3 million tons per annum. And we will cover this later on in the presentation. Operations at our iron ore business in Goa remain suspended through the year. We stay continuously engaged with the central and the state government, but importantly, the people who are impacted by lack of mining in Goa to resume production given the benefit to all of the stakeholders. At Sterilite Copper, we continue to engage with the government, the relevant authorities, the courts, and all stakeholders to enable a safe and supported restart of our operations at Tutakuran. Now let's come to strategy. I'll summarize in this section reminding you of our five key strategic priorities to drive long-term value for our stakeholders. Firstly, ethics, governance, and social license to operate. That is the foundation of any business. We will continue our journey towards zero harm by ensuring greater levels of safety and ever gentler impact on the environment and resources and even greater inroads into delivering health care, education, skills, and quality of life where it's needed in our communities. Second, it's all about ground positions and reserves and resources. With focused exploration to augment our long life, low cost assets by improving our land positions, growing our resources, converting resources to reserves in our business, thereby more than offsetting depletion and bringing on stream more discoveries to extend our already long mine lives. Third, continued track of delivering value added growth. If you look at what the company has achieved in over a decade in terms of growth trajectory, it is truly spectacular. And here the focus is on the key three businesses which account for 90% of our EBITDA, namely zinc, lead, and silver, oil and gas, and aluminum. Four, strict capital allocation and balance sheet focus. As managers of the business, we will follow ruthless and strict capital allocation whilst keeping the balance sheet in sharp focus. 
balance sheet is proactively managed with a business having to earn their capital before spending. And Arun will articulate where our debt levels are relative to our EBITDA position, which is very, very comfortable. Finally, it's all about delivering the best out of your assets based. With the best teams and the means to focus on operational delivery and having the right management and teams in place to deliver what we want. Asset planning, execution, operational excellence, cost control and reduction, productivity enhancement, improving realizations, risk mitigation, use of technology, innovation and digitization, and most importantly, constantly benchmarking ourselves against the best, the best in class, and trying to exceed that will enable us to sweat our assets better and deliver enhanced performance. With that, I will request Arun to cover the financial performance of the company. Thanks, Venkat, and uh, good evening, everyone. I'll start by sort of repeating that this year has been a strong year for the company, where all our businesses delivered on their growth investments. Hansberg Zinc came on steam. Zinc India underground volumes ramped up, more than making up for the open cast of last year. We entered the elite club of top silver producers in the world with record silver production. Robust turnaround of the electro steel post acquisition and constantly improving cost structure in the aluminum business. Last but not the least, 35 new wells hooked up in, in the oil and gas business as well as the gas bridge project just about coming on online anytime now. We also expect and hope the copper smelter to restart sometime during this year. These are fundamental building blocks for our growth in each of our businesses and that in place and I expect to see them contribute to the bottom line going forward. Some key highlights for the quarter and the year. EBITDA of quarter four was at 6,330 crores, which is about 6% up sequentially, while over 4Q 2018, it was down 19%, all of it either attributable to price, the copper smelter shutdown, or one-off counting reversals in last year. Full year was around 24,000 crores, flattish, excluding copper, and one-offs of the base year, yet a robust margin of 30%. Strong end to the year's cash with the free cash flow post capex of 11,550 crores, up 47%, and also a strong closing balance of cash, about 39,000 crores, sort of liquidity, as you can see. Pinkett alluded to this net debt EBITDA continues to remain strong at around 1.1x. ROC is around 13%. We believe could strengthen further with the growth blocks in place that we just discussed. Contribution for the year to the exchequer was significantly higher at about 42,500 crores. Last year was about 33,000 crores. With a strong close to Q4, we believe we are geared up to a strong volume growth and a competitive cost position looking ahead in FI20. We have a detailed uh, income statement in the appendix, but a uh, few key updates I might just cover out here. Depreciation charge uh, below EBITDA. For Q4 and also full year was driven by growth capex, and yet higher this year thanks to the impairment reversal which happened at the end of last year in the oil and gas business. For FI20, I see that continuing in the same run rate as the quarter four, probably slightly elevated levels as we keep capitalizing more and more of the growth spends. Investment income for Q4 and FI19 is higher, mainly due to the mark-to-mark -mark gains of nearly about 715 crores net of Forex, on treasury investment made by our overseas subsidiary Kane Hydrocarbon CIHL through a purchase of the economic interest in the structured investment in the underlying Anglo-American shares as we discussed quite in detail in the last quarter. These are partially offset by lower investment corpus uh, post-dividends in quarter three. Investment income should continue at current levels as per our guidance for FI20, which is sort of 7% return on the cash portfolio. Of course, it will be subject to mark-to-mark -mark on the entire portfolio, wherever it's uh, underlying is debt, FMP, so, or the structure that we have invested in, both will have mark-to-mark. -mark. Otherwise, the general return is about 7%. On the finance cost line in Q4, pretty much in line with the guidance. FI19 will largely be driven by a full-year impact of the acquisition debt of uh, electrosteel. In FI20, the average cost of the debt book will continue to be around 8.28.5%, depending on where the yield curve is. Objective will be to absolutely reduce 
the, uh, the debt number as well, the already low debt number, with increasing surplus cash earnings from all three key businesses. And I repeat, surplus earnings from all the three key businesses, including aluminum, zinc, and oil and gas, all post-funding the growth capex. The fourth uh, item would be tax, the last line below EBITDA. The tax rate before exceptional items and DDT for the year was around 28%. Uh, but closer to 30% if you exclude the mark-to-mark -mark gains on the interest line. Because as you know, that's an overseas entity and really not subject to tax. Broadly in line with the guidance that we had given at around 30%. And uh, next year, FI20, we retain the same guidance of around 30 to 32%. So it starts tending towards maximum marginal rate. Moving on to the next page. On the EBITDA bridge, this sequential EBITDA walk is perhaps a relevant page this time uh, which sort of showcases the progress we made during the quarter four, in general, the second half of the year. The quarter three EBITDA adjusted to LME and currency is around 5,600, 700 crores. Compared to that, we have delivered, as you can see on the right side of this chart, volume as well as cost, driving the EBITDA up by nearly 1,000 crores to land around 6,330 crores. The cost drivers are primarily aluminum. I'm sure Ajay Kapoor will talk a lot about it in the Q&A session, as well as some costs in Zinc India also got taken out as the underground started stabilizing in the second half of the year. Volume reflects increasing output in Zinc International, a full year stable uh, sort of an output in steel or a full quarter output, I would say. We covered this in detail on the previous page as well. A strong close to quarter four across our businesses sort of augurs very well or a stronger FI20. If I have to draw attention to page 30 of the guidance chart, I mean, I'm, it's, it's there with you all. Uh, presentations have been circulated. You'll notice that we made some key guidance uh, out here for your benefit. Volume increase of nearly 12% at Zinc India. Sunil already spoke about it in the Hindustan Zinc results. So he's indicated circa a million tons finished zinc lead. Uh, zinc International up by nearly two and a half uh, times actually, driven really by Ansberg coming on uh, Steam, and also Scorpion as for the mine life. I understand some of you here visited Ansberg as part of our investor visit as well and saw for yourself the ramp up underway. Silver is significantly up is the other guidance that we had given, closer to 750 to 800 tons for next year as again 670 this year. So that's another handsome increase of anywhere up to 15 to 20 percent. Oil and gas volumes again up 10 percent approximately. Steel volumes on a full year basis up uh, 26 percent. That's because of the full year impact coming uh, as we've ramped up at the end of FY19 to 1.5 million tons and you get the full year benefit of it next year. Uh, important to remember in steel also the compounding effect of the EBITDA margin, right? Because if you see the margins also exited at about 140 and if you do a full year guidance versus a full year FY19, margins would also be up uh, nearly 15%, so it could have a compounding effect here. I know Karnataka sales should be up about 25%, albeit on a small base uh, in FI20. That's a guidance that we've given. On the cost side, importantly, uh, aluminum hot metal costs are guided down almost 9% on an average versus FI19. Uh, that's, again, all that we do there is just maintain your quarter four run rate. And I'm sure Ajay and the team can get better, but from a guidance perspective, it's pretty much maintaining the quarter 400 that we exited. Zinc, in the, uh, Zinc India in the vicinity of about $1,000, holding quite well out there. These are all EBITDA positive for the company, and the focus of the management team will hence be on execution. While we don't guide on prices, we do expect the prices to be on the, around the current levels. There will be ups and downs. Tight demand supply balance in Zinc continues with low inventories. Oil is supported by geopolitical dynamics, and aluminum more or less led by China demand. Moving on to the next page. On this EBITDA bridge, uh, which is pretty much for the full year EBITDA, as I mentioned, FI19 was about 4% lower, rounded off to about 24,000 crores as compared to FI18. As I mentioned earlier, excluding pretty much price, copper shutdown and one-off, it was flattish. Much of the volume gains, and there were volume gains, were offset by structural cost inflation in aluminum, uh, thanks to alumina prices and some related to coal, but all of which have been largely corrected as we exited quarter four. 
the guidance which I covered in detail should give us significant confidence and I hope reassurance as well as we start delivering FI20. Moving on further to the next page on net debt. As you can see, we've generated a cash of around 11,550 crores from operations, almost 50% uh, of our EBITDA roundabouts, 45 to 50%. Full year working capital was positive with good release from tax balances, both direct and indirect, where we collected a lot of refunds. Gross working capital initiatives, we ran a company-wide working capital optimization program and further controls on the stock levels. We'll discuss uh, on the CapEx uh, bar here more on detail in the next page, but important to mention that CapEx for the year was within the guidance. Broadly, one can conclude that the dividend payouts were funded by surplus cash post CapEx requirements and the resultant increase in net debt is uh, pretty much the acquisition debt. And, uh, of course, the acquisition debt will in turn get supported by the expected increase in steel EBITDA and FI20. And we talked about the multiplier effect of both volume and margin out there. Uh, thus, keeping track uh, with its investment case as well, the steel side. Moving on, uh, broadly displaying the fact that we have a strong financial returns profile, a focus on balance sheet management continues. We had refinanced our FI19 maturities well in advance in H1 itself. Also, thanks to the robust operation, operational performance, uh, cash flows, and excellent uh, banking relationships, we were able to effectively refinance and sort of navigate some of the choppy uh, capital markets in the second half of last year. The average maturity of term debt consistently remains about three years on a rolling basis, with a strategy in place to further improve it in the coming year in FI20. We've been able to hold our average borrowing cost at a little over 8% for the whole year. Our investments are also rated tier one by Criswell. And with the evolving market situation, the portfolio is being monitored tightly and on a continuous basis. Uh, as I mentioned, our relationship with the banks and capital market participants remains strong. And we continue to further widen and deepen our access out there. Moving on to CapEx page, our uh, capital allocation strategy is a disciplined distribution towards achieving the overall objective of maximizing shareholder returns, delevering the balance sheet, and investing in the next phase of growth projects. Over the years, we have prudently uh, allocated the capital as well, uh, basically in zinc ahead of the curve, now giving strong returns uh, as the prices are pretty good in the last 18 months and next 12 months or two going forward. Uh, with the Kane merger, we are delevered as well. And now we are investing back in the growth projects in the oil and gas sector, which, as you would observe on this page, will be the biggest spend segment for FI20. Iron and steel and, uh, will also see some investments, primarily at uh, Electro Steel, when we start expanding. Our CapEx over years have been largely self-funded, and we continue with that even during FI. 19, and no reason to believe otherwise in 520. Everything will come from the cash flows that we generate. All the projects have hurdle rates of 15, 20%. Venkat as well uh, mentioned it. And next year, just to call a number out, the number is about $1.4 billion. That's the capex that we are guiding. Primarily, again, in oil and gas and zinc. We also retain an optionality there within the 1.4 because there are a few projects that we are looking at uh, in aluminum and bauxite as well. Uh, with that, uh, I can just wrap up and say that we continue to allocate the capital prudently, focus on cash flows through increasing volumes and lowering costs, thus funding robust shareholder returns. That's the bottom line. With that, hand it over back to Venkat. Thanks, Arun. We saw our three large businesses, which represent 90% of the group's EBITDA, achieve significant milestone which gives us a very strong foundation in terms of our near-term targets that we have set for these businesses. Starting with zinc, lead, and silver, as I said, we are very pleased that the transition to underground mining has gone very well, and the production went up from an underground mining point of view by 29%, and silver shot up by 22%. And I'm very optimistic about our SK mine, and the silver production coming out of uh, SK mine, which shot up 22%, rising to around 800 tons next year and making its way towards 1,000 tons. What we are looking at building is on this success in 2020 to achieve mined metal design capacity of 1.2 million tons, 
and a further ramp up in silver production that we outlined. As these volumes go up, coupled with our own cost reduction efforts, we expect the unit cost in the businesses to come down also. Our growth projects are progressing well to achieve this, and these include in very simple terms, ways to mine more, shaft commissioning to haul and hoist more, refine more through additional mills, extract more silver through a FUMA project, and make our operations sustainable through pace fill plants. The Zinc India business is a great example of using innovation, technology, and planned execution to achieve sustainable growth. In fact, most of these plants, et cetera, have been bought on stream in a pretty flawless manner. Turning to Zinc India, we are equally pleased that we are replicating this success at our flagship Humsburg project in South Africa, which has got an abundant resource. We achieved the milestone in December where we shipped the first parcel of concentrate, and we are now ramping to its target MIC capacity of 250,000 tons. And as I said in the last call, the focus here is to address all of the teething issues so that once you've achieved the full ramp up, then it starts to operate in a steady manner. This new age fully automated digital mine will be the catalyst for that region's development and a significant contributor to Vedanta's earnings over the nine to 12 months. And certainly in 2019 going into 2020, when you take Zinc International and Hindustan Zinc together, we are cementing ourselves to becoming the largest producer of zinc in the world with the lowest cost and a suite of long life assets. Now moving to oil and gas, we have an optimum portfolio mix here across the oil and gas life cycle. During the year, our production sharing contracts for Rajasthan and Rava blocks have been extended for a period of 10 years subject to certain conditions. At the end of March, we had ramped up the development rigs to 11, our early production facility to ramp up gas volumes by 90 million scuffs, which is around 15,000 15, barrels of oil and gas equivalent per day, is being commissioned and will be gradually be ramping up volumes from that source as well. And in continuation of our efforts to enhance our resource base, we have issued a global tender inviting bids for end-to-end -end integrated contracts for the 41 blocks that we've been awarded under OALP. And we were also awarded two development fields under the DSF Round 2 in Assam and the KG Basin. We continue to work on many growth projects across a rich set of opportunities covering enhanced oil recovery, tight oil, tight gas, and exploration and appraisal project, prospects. As part of the strategy, we will continue to have an integrated model, a partnership model with some of the global oil field service companies. The internal rate of return which each of these projects have to cross is 20% of a $40 per barrel price. With 11 rigs at site, we are witnessing significant increased activity levels in the field, which requires a fair amount of integration. The number of wells shall almost double from the current 500 to over 900 over the next two years. Our disciplined low-cost operating model with cutting-edge technology adoption shall enable us to increase production and achieve world-class recovery rates. Our exploration efforts are focused on adding to our resource base. The step change in production comes from new discoveries. Both the wells drilled in KG offshore block have been declared as discoveries. We are evaluating the data to plan the way forward in this block. In Rajasthan, we have awarded integrated contracts for drilling around seven to 18 exploration wells. In Rava, we have awarded the integrated contract for exploration and development for nine to 16 wells. The campaign in both these blocks is expected to start in the second quarter of the current fiscal year. Beyond this, the acquisition of the 41 exploration blocks has made us the largest private acreage holder in India in the current quarter, we'll evaluate the techno-commercial bids to award exploration and appraisal contracts through, as I said, the integrated partnership model. And all of these projects are at the back of the world-class resource base with gross 2P reserves and 2C resources of 1.2 billion barrels. Our exploration and appraisal efforts are focused on adding to the resource base. And all of our development efforts are focused on increasing production to the target level of around 270 to 300,000 barrels of oil and gas equivalent per day. As the group CEO, I tend to be the integrator. The businesses are very federal, so my job is to ensure that we keep our social license to operate and drive the ESG 
and also have visibility around long life and exploration efforts. So these are two things which will be driving very, very hard. Turning to aluminium, we are very happy to report that we have proved some of the skeptics wrong and we achieved record metal production of 1.96 million tons. I remember doing the first set of calls and road shows. People said that they have heard the story before so many times, are we going to get to below $2,000 a ton? Our alumina refinery ramped up strongly this year and achieved a peak run rate of 1.8 million tons per annum as local bauxite sourcing ramped up during the year. Half of our refinery's bauxite requirement for Q4 was met from these local sources. On costs, we faced some headwinds in the first half of 2019, as you are well aware, but we are encouraged as a result of many structural changes that we have put in place we, in the business, we have managed to reduce the overall cost. The cost of production in Q4 2019 was $1,776 a ton, significantly lower compared to the previous quarters, which was around $2,200 to $2,300 a ton. Over the last year, we have shared with you our target to get to cost of production of $1,500 a ton. We are enthused to share that we have significant structural improvements in the aluminium business, which makes me believe that this target is achievable. We will see volatility in the interim, of course, but the trajectory for the cost reduction has been set. How do we achieve that? The production volumes for aluminium has been enhanced to 2 million tons. Let me take up each of our input commodities individually. Our alumina sourcing will be a mix of own alumina and imported alumina. The Langiger refinery has been ramped up and achieving a peak exit rate of 1.8 million tons per annum, we plan to ramp this up further in stages to 2.7 million tons per annum with a further ramp up to 4 million tons per annum in the medium term. This year, we also started getting dispatches of local bauxite. We expect the local bauxite to meet a third of our requirements for the year. Further bauxite security has been ensured through a long-term contract with EGA. We saw repeated headwinds on coal supply during the first nine months of the year. However, we ended the year successfully with coal inventory of more than 10 days at most of our plants. For this year, with 3.2 tons of, million tons of coal secured in tranche 4 auction, along with our previous linkages and our own captive Chotia mine, we have increased our coal security to around 72%. We have set Ajay Kapoor an ambitious target of increasing the security to 90% through participation in auctions of coal mines and more linkage auctions. Further initiatives on logistics, long-term contracts on carbon are also being worked upon. On the market side, the focus remains to sell more domestically and increase the proportion of value-added products, thereby improving margins. Turning to electrosteel, which is a successful turnaround story, production has ramped up to 1.2 million tons per year with an exit run rate of hot metal of 1.5 million tons and EBITDA margins of around $122 a ton. The business achieved record volumes, EBITDA and free cash flow, with an industry-leading margin of around 19%. The plan ahead is to ramp up eventually to the design capacity of 2.5 million tons, backed by iron ore mines in Jharkhand, and supported by a diversified value-added portfolio at the front end. To conclude, Vedanta remains a great investment case. A large-scale diversified portfolio with an attractive cost position in core businesses positions us very well to deliver strong margins and cash flows through the commodity cycle. We have positioned ourselves in base metals and oils, make our commodity mix particularly attractive. India is Vedanta's core market and one which has huge growth potential. We are strongly and uniquely positioned to benefit from this growth. With our earlier investment driving our cash flows, we have a strong pipeline of self-funded, high-return growth projects to further solidify our premier position in our commodities. We are consistently striving to improve our operations, integrate our businesses and our value chain, and optimize our performance through operational efficiencies and innovative technological solutions. Our operational performance coupled with a strong focus on optimization of capital allocation and a sharp focus on returns have helped us strengthen our financial profile. We have a proven management team here with 
good bench strength with a diverse and extensive range of sector and global experience who will ensure that operations are run efficiently and responsibly. And beyond operating and financial metrics, the two big purposes which we serve are giving back to the country, the planet, and the community, and the country. And importantly, we are also in the task of producing business leaders. We catch them young and develop and groom them. With that, I'd like to thank everyone. Given that you hear me often in the conference calls in the quarterly results, I'm going to try and speak very little now in the Q&A and give you an opportunity to interact with the, the CEOs who are here and on the phone, and I will only supplement as and when needed. So with those comments, hand over to Rashmi. Thank you, Venkat. Uh, so we have uh, audience on the audio call and on the webcast as well, but we'll take a few questions from the live audience here, and then also switch into taking questions from the webcast audience. Uh, but any questions? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hi, Venkat. This is Anuj. I'm from Bank of America. So my question is on oil and gas side. As you mentioned, uh, a significant portion of the incremental capex is going there, more than 50%. You know, last year as well, and next year also we are targeting half a million. So this uh, segment has actually disappointed on the ramp up consistently. So this year also we were targeting around 220 barrels, and we ended there at 189. And the next year target is now 200 to 220, which is a very you know subdued target versus where the growth expectations were earlier. So what has gone wrong there? Number one. Secondly, what makes us or gives us the confidence that we will be able to achieve the 270, you know, medium-term target which we have, and what happens to the half a billion target which uh, we had communicated, half a million target which we had communicated earlier? Yeah. So, uh, hello. Uh, I would say if we take from 180 for 185 where we are today, if we have the slide again on the oil and gas. Uh, in a very simple terms, what you see is a bottom production. This is a simple one where additional wells are getting added to be hooked up. Previous one. <coughs> Still previous. Yeah. So these are the cases what you see. Uh, while drilling in this exploration this time, we had to go much deeper in terms of the depth as well as uh, we have drilled now horizontal well which is first of its kind. Now this all has taken a certain amount of being reassurance to be done on what we are trying to do in the entire extraction of oil and going forward. And these successes are now giving us confidence that this production, what we are adding over here for adding more wells, would clearly give us and kick in over here for the, let's say from the second quarter, we would get this close to about 20, what you see at the bottom uh, uh, bucket. Then the development part, if you see, if you leave the ASP part, which is MBA ASP, other than this, the rest of it is another close to about 80 to 90. And these are kicking in quarter-wise in phases. And the MBA ASP is a pure big target which is going to give us more than 90. A portion of it comes end of the year. So close to about 90 to 100 comes from this and these projects are in place. For example, if we take tight gas, which is another big number over here, about 45, we will start getting close to about 15, 16, 15 to 20 sometime in the month of August and the balance sometime in December, January. So the progress of these projects are on schedule. So if you look at it, this therefore a closed number which we are saying a guidance, uh, exit rate of around 270 to 300 and an average of 200 to 220 is very clearly on track and visible with projects which are running on ground and as per schedule what we have seen. There has been rescheduling done based on the new type of wells which we are now drilling more which are horizontal well which takes time and therefore it takes time also on the integration and accordingly the surface facility coming up sometime in January and February. So therefore the confidence level is very high and these will the numbers will be achieved. Can I just come in here quickly? Just in terms of the confidence to get to 275, 300, a high level of confidence, largely because I look at it in a couple of buckets. The first bucket is existing production, and here it's around how you actually manage your decline management, and there if you go back and look at 
what forecast decline rates were compared to now, we have done much better. Secondly, in terms of reservoir management, well reservoir management, and also bringing on stream additional liquid handling capacity and improving recoveries. That's one bucket. The second bucket is bringing on stream the various development projects, whether it's in terms of additional wells, hooking them on, then bringing on stream gas, and also bringing on stream tight oil and tight gas projects as well. That's the second bucket. The third bucket is ASP, uh, which has been piloted, and the recoveries will actually improve quite significantly. That's the third bucket. The fourth bucket in terms of step change is bringing on stream new discoveries closer to the infrastructure so that they can be processed through the terminal and add to it your offshore kicker coming in as well. All of these give us the comfort that 27 to 275 to 300 is within meeting range. You asked us about what went wrong. I think the question here to be thing is we probably should have estimated our, our integration probably better. And with these large projects, you rather take your time, do a proper allocation of the contract rather than rush and give a contract and find that you have actually shot yourself in the foot. But now with those contracts going through the proper mechanism, quite confident that getting through to 275 to 300,000 barrels of oil and gas equivalent is within shooting range. Sure. So uh, just follow up. What is the timeline? I mean, I'm not going to hold you to that. Uh, but what is the timeline for 275 to uh, 300? Is there a three-year plan? Just told, well, that's what I just told you, that uh, we, we get close to about 210, 220 in the range that uh, start producing around 210 in the second quarter. And uh, around the third quarter, we go closer, exceeding around 250, 260. And then we come to the fourth quarter around 270 plus. So exit rate will be in exit that rate. Rate. So the average... Thank you. If we look at the balance sheet over the last two years, uh, the net debt has spiked up. Uh, and uh, the main concern investors have is the leverage of the parent uh, Vedanta resources. How should we look at dividend uh, policy from here? Uh, it has been ad hoc. Uh, and to that extent, uh, would we increase leverage at Hindustan Zinc and Vedanta Limited to pay out higher dividend? Or will dividend be a function of only the free cash flow uh, and nothing else? Yeah, I think uh, our uh, uh, articulation of uh, the capital allocation has been fairly consistent, I would say, in the last uh, few years, far from erratic. We've always said we're going for the operating asset. right? Get the volume up, get the cost down. Right? Of course, in the journey, you would have a few bumps like the aluminum inflation, etc. But then that's also pretty much exited quite strongly if you see the quarter four. So you have a strong operating asset. We've always been self-funding our growth capex. Even last year, right, 24,000 crores is roughly what about three and a half billion dollars in dollar terms, right? Even with that, we've uh, probably generated close to about uh, 1.7, 1.8 billion dollar of free cash flow post capex. This is 11,550 crores. If you see, uh, the point I'm driving here is after funding for our growth plan, price not in our control, some aspects of inflation not in our control. Post that, we said the next box of capital allocation is shareholder return. And we have been very consistent with the dividends also. Uh, if you see the last three years, the average dividend uh, per year would be in the range of 18.5 rupees to 20.25, I guess which would give you um, pretty much consistently year on year. The timing could vary between the year, but fundamentally it's been uh, fairly consistent. And the free cash flows are actually funded, thus taking us into another very attractive sort of an um, investment vehicle from equity po uh, point of view is the dividend yield. Right? Our dividend yield has consistently been between 7 and 8 percent in the last three years. And uh, among the private sector, either the first or second in the Nifty 50. And you, you know your Nifty uh, 50 the, uh, yield is roughly about 1.8% on an average. So we've earned our way through growth, and the earnings that we've had, we've deployed probably in returning to the shareholders. And yes, we had a bolt-on acquisition, uh, which came in around uh, July, and it took us about seven, eight months to have a nice sustained turnaround. It's a nice sweet story now, uh, a sweet success spot, if you see, in steel. And uh, we, we ramped up to 140. We still don't have an iron ore mine that should come through. And you can imagine competitor one is uh, $184 exited. Competitor two is $167. We're almost at 140. So can be a small capacity, but reaching that. So that acquisition debt will start paying up in FY20. So the debt has been sort of constant, I would say, subject to acquisition. 
capital allocation policy consistent. We are managing between the buckets uh, of reduce gross debt for sure, manage capex and then return to the shareholders. And the average uh, dividend for the last three years has been almost in the range of plus minus five seven percent. So I, I hope that uh, helped answer the question. Sure. Uh, and the Alumina expansion has been now optionality for two three years. I mean, what is holding back the project from getting through? Is it regulatory approval? Is it uh, bauxite? Is it capital? Uh, I mean, how should we look at? Will it uh, will it expand in the future? Sure, I think uh, Ajay will handle this. It is actually good news. We are going ahead, but. Uh, so first is, uh, you know, you saw uh, increase about one-fourth in the capacity. Uh, it comes because of our local bauxite sourcing to the uh, government-owned Odisha bauxite, where they already have a run rate of 3 million. We are confident that we will win some more mines in the vicinity, and we have a very tight schedule to now look at immediately expanding by about a million. Uh, the team is working on it, uh, and I, I can only tell you that uh, the way we have expanded in the last... Uh, uh, year or so, uh, this should not be very long. I think I am looking at a 24 month on the horizon. Uh, so we go from 2 to 3. 2 to 3 and then go to 4. And, and the 3 to 4 will be additional effective Addition. capex. This yes. is just the earlier capex which was half completed. Absolutely. So, so we do it smart capex. Thank you. Amit, you have a Yeah, Amit Dikshit from Edelweiss. Uh, my question pertains to the note number 9 in the account regarding, uh, sorry, note number 8 regarding the uh, that instrument, that Vulcan instrument. Just if you could reconcile it that how much we have to pay, how much we have already paid and how it is reconciled in balance sheet on a second liability side. Right, I'll just talk in dollar million so it's sort of easier. Just above 500 million was the total instrument that we had uh, mentioned during the quarter three call, out of which as of year ending FI 19, we have paid up approximately $270 million. We probably have another $250 million to be paid up over the next uh, four to five quarters, so to say. And um, uh, we did go through in a lot of detail during the call and post the call last time and very happy to report that you've uh, taken note of note number eight and I also covered it in my talk track that uh, the underlying value did go up significantly, and we have recorded mark-to-mark -mark gains. The cumulative gain is uh, roughly about $130 million odd net of FX uh, swing, which is about 900 crores odd uh, between quarter three and quarter four, but primarily in quarter four. And uh, on the balance sheet, uh, it is shown as cash and cash equivalent. So 39,000 crores includes this $270 million, or roughly 2,000 crores that has been paid out. Right. Uh, we do believe it's liquid, but if you uh, really want to strip it out, then 37,000 crores of cash and 2,000 crores roughly of uh, this uh, structured investment is how you look at it as given in the appendix. Uh, so just to follow up question on this, now uh, you have said that total consideration is 3812 crores that you have paid in this year. Uh, is it correct? Uh, we said the total consideration is 3,800, which is just about $500 million, okay. out of which about, uh, uh, you should say, 55% has been paid out, and the balance 45 in the next five quarters. So when you say the fair value of investment is 4,772 crores, so what does that include? That includes this two fifty sorry, two seventy million million that you have paid, plus MTM gains. Correct. And the present value of the future payment. So it's a valuation methodology. The broad way to... Look at it as 25 million shares multiplied by approximately every pound of uh, movement. Multiplied by 1.3 will give you dollar and the rupee. And the second uh, question, you know, and uh, because the investors have been really wary of what is our, you know, uh, rationale for acquiring this take in Anglo. What is the end game like? I mean, we all know that this is going to, the option is going to come for uh, the maturity next year. So what will happen then? I'll answer that question, and uh, we outlined very clearly the rationale behind why the investment went in. It was purely because it was giving superior returns, and uh, with hindsight has shown that actually it delivered those returns here. As far as Vedanta is concerned, and Vulcan has actually is still holding the ownership of the shares and the voting rights. It's got nothing to do with Vedanta uh, uh, group at all. So as far as we are concerned, on April 20 and October 20, those structures will unwind and the money will come back to us. So there isn't a game plan which involves that underlying share as far as Vedanta is concerned. Okay, thank you. 
I'll just take one question from the webcast audience and then come back here. Uh, the question is from Ritesh Shah from Investec. Uh, his first question is, on electoral steel, 90% of the stake is with Vedanta Star Limited. Uh, how do you look at the balanced 10% residual stake? Are we looking to delist or buy out the minority? The delisting process uh, is on actually. The, the, it's actually been delisted and now uh, it's, in the, uh, it's in the process of merger with Vedanta Star Limited and there will be a formula-based uh, payout which is not more than $30, $40 million approximately to the 10% of the shareholders. So it's a pretty much a procedural thing. The more exciting thing about uh, Electro, Electro Steel and Vedanta Star really about the ability to expand the volumes there with very marginal capex and the multiplier effect I talked about in terms of the base year volume versus next year stabilized volume and the ramped up EBITDA at a full year level versus the average lower EBITDA of this year. So that should give a good EBITDA uh, growth or a growth uh, block for Vedanta and FY20. He has another question. question. Um, is there any scope of moving the Hamburg ore to feed the Indian Hindustan zinc smelter? So I think uh, this question was already out in Hindustan zinc uh, call. Uh, we have no plan uh, to move the uh, concentrate to Hindustan zinc because the smelters are uh, located in the landlocked area. So it, uh, if we would have some smelter located at uh, you know at our port. Uh, would have taken that call, number one. Number two, we have a material balance in Hindustan Zinc wherein, you know, we have the expansion coming up from uh, our mines and we balance it with the smelter capacity. So we are deportlacking the smelter as required uh, to fill in the capacity coming from the expansion of the mines. But uh, we definitely have a plan to put up a smelter at Hamsburg. We are evaluating that opportunity, but we will come at the right time to say that... Uh, when our work will start and when, our, when we are ready to go. Thank you, Sunil. There's one more question from Ashish Kejriwal from IDFC. He's asked that the net debt has reduced significantly by Rs. 126 billion quarter on quarter to Rs. 270 billion. The EBITDA in quarter 4 was just Rs. 63 billion. What could be the reason for the net debt reduction? I think uh, in the last quarter results we had uh, guided that uh, we will uh, definitely have a good quarter four in terms of pulling back some of the working capital investments. We do see a lot of efficiency kick in in the second half of the year, or sales maximize, and uh, that is one uh, prime reason why we have been able to achieve what we did. Now, the good news is that the full year number is around $1.7 billion, 11,500 crores of free cash flow post capex, uh, approximately about 45 to 50% of the EBITDA generation. If you look at the last four years of trend, you would find Vedanta consistently at that percentage, whatever be the level of EBITDA given the price ups and downs, because we manage our whole cash flow so that we leave enough on the table, uh, again, to meet all the three uh, requirements that I laid out earlier. Yeah, so I think it's in continuation of the previous questions only which were asked. Um, so just to uh, you know go back to the promoter entity, uh, we are seeing almost $700 million of annual interest outgo is what they're faced with right now, which translates to if it has to be matched with the dividend payment from India, almost $1.6, $1.7 billion, given that they have 50% stake. Now, the cash of zinc is sort of at 16,000 crores, and then, you know, we have some four or 5,000 crores left with gain. So we are approaching that level where, you know, even uh, full cash outgo from zinc is probably not enough to meet this sort of commitment. So what are we looking at? Are we looking at some sort of take sale in zinc or debt in zinc and you know something has to match up so as to you know meet expectations at the promoter level that's point number one point number two on uh, on the cane side you know 186 was the total production for this year and if you can break it up between rajasthan and uh, the rest because what we are seeing is a natural decline in the rajasthan fields now this natural decline was supposed to be offset by the enhanced oil recovery to a certain extent which is not happening uh, so, uh, on what base are we adding the additional, you know, 90, uh, you know, uh, KBPOD and uh, from the development projects and the base 40 from the new drilling projects, if you can just break that part a bit over the next two, three years. And the last question, if I may, just to, you know, refresh my memory, I think there has been a bit of tone down for FY20 production as far as Zinc International is concerned. Um, uh, and FI21 guidance has been given, but if you also give 
you know, take us through the FI22 guidance, uh, or, or rather FI21 guidance, because Scorpion will run out in FI21, the 112 KT that you're showing in Scorpion. So if you can also just briefly guide to the production that one should expect from Zinc International in FI21. Why don't Arun take the first one? Ajay, second, and if Deshni is on the call, she can take the third question. Sure, I think, uh, you know, fundamentally, far from those thoughts that you're thinking about, and again, we have to ask the question, uh, in the first half, in March 18, if you go even back, my cash balance has been more or less constant, which really comes back to the point we had earlier, that we are generating enough free cash flow, post our CapEx needs to do any shareholder rewards that we have to. Uh, and this is a Vedanta Limited, so I'm not going into detail in the, from the parent side, but uh, whatever little public information is available, you would um, uh, gather that the annual servicing is around 350 to 400 million dollars. Right, so that's not much. And plus, there is a separate asset where uh, they, we also have Zambian Mines and Copper, which directly roll into the parent. But I don't want to get into that. They also generate cash flows and have good potential out there. So multiple assets, and uh, it's a strong uh, holding at that point of time. And it enables us to access capital, global capital. We just did a global bond issue, and the biggest bond issuance uh, by an Indian uh, high-yield name since uh, August 2017. So that's the strength of uh, Vedanta and Vedanta name globally. Between the parent and uh, Vedanta Limited, there isn't a company which in the last 15 years has uh, financed and refinanced nearly $40 billion of global uh, debt raising in capital markets. So, and also gives us access to so many bank relationships, be it Far East, Mid East, Far West, Indian banks, private banks, etc. So I think we are in a good spot. The fundamental focus for us is really on those growth blocks on EBITDA. Right. We did mention Electrosteel, we have big growth block even though it's small volume, but the effect is big. ZI, as you rightly observed, and I'm sure Deshni will address it, Ansberg goes from zero to nothing. And Sunil Zinc India simply has to grow. Uh, even a Hindu growth rate, Hindu rate of growth is enough for him to generate big EBITDA, if you see what I mean, and he's already guided 12% up in volumes. And with that kind of margins, with first decile cost positioning, just look at the quality of this asset and more important than not is India needs a country, I mean a company like this, a natural resources company in the Indian subcontinent where one out of every four human beings live. There is no other company doing this kind of business. Yes, there are some, some other companies, the power, the steel, the automobile, etc. But natural resources play, fundamental resources that go into everything is a, is a basic need of all of us. So I think that's what really drives us to deliver more and we have enough the building blocks on our EBITDA and uh, I don't think uh, we dip into our cash reserves that way. I mean, they're, they're all there for the rainy day, but having almost 40,000 crores of cash reserve is, is fantastic. I believe it's probably the second uh, biggest treasury in the country as well. So that's another data point. And this is after contributing nearly 43,000 crores to the exchequer. Government of India, whether revenue, I mean, whether um, uh, sales, royalty, tax, indirect tax, dividends, etc., which again places us either at number one or number two uh, in, in the country. So I think all of us can feel uh, good to have this kind of quality assets and that kind of uh, cash flow streams to meet all our uh, natural resources ambitions for this subcontinent. Yeah, so when we said about uh, 200 to 220, the decline has been accounted for. Uh, just I would reconcile again the number which I said in the beginning, the bottom production is close to about 25. And the other than ASP, I said, is close to about 90 plus. So even if you consider another 20-25 decline and you add back, you reach an exit rate of about 270 plus. So on an average, therefore, this number is including the, uh, considering the decline. Thanks, Ajay. Deshni, if you're on the call, can you take up the third question? Guidance from ZI for FI20 and then, if possible, uh, some insight as to the next plan? Sure. Uh, Rashni, am I, am I audible? Hello, Rashni, am I audible? Yes, Rashni, thanks. All right, okay, thank you. All right, so in terms of how to look at Zing International, you know, over the next two to three years, Black Mountain continues to be a stable producer around that 
70 odd thousand tons of MIC uh, level. In terms of uh, Scorpion, you're absolutely right. Scorpion starts to ramp down in the next financial year. You would remember when we gave guidance on the PIT 112 pushback, we indicated that we had some 250 to 270 thousand tons of zinc metal that we could get out of it. Uh, last year's production took around 60 odd thousand of that. So we are left with around 200,000 tons of zinc metal between this year and next year. Of course, the plan is to accelerate that metal production this year and then the balance try and shorten the life for uh, next year. So we've guided more on the ore production leading into metal for uh, Scorpion this year. But between this year and next year, we want to, we want to uh, produce just under 200,000 tons of zinc uh, metal. As it stands, the plan with the Scorpion uh, this year is around 120, 130,000 tons of uh, zinc metal. And if you look at its uh, Scorpion's performance over the last uh, three years, this will be one of its largest uh, years, all driven by the fact that we start to get into some double-digit grade uh, pockets within this uh, pit. On Humsburg, you know, if you look at the entire project, we kept on talking about an average grade of 6 to 6.5%. So I look at Humsburg in terms of how quickly I can ramp it up to treat 4 million tons of ore from a run of mine uh, point of view as early on as uh, possible. In terms of how we planned this year, we get to close to that ramp up of 330,000 tons of ore treatment by the end of quarter one. But because we continue to be in a lower grade regime than the average grade from now till the end of this uh, financial year, we are therefore guiding around 180,000 tons to 200,000 tons of MIC. And then next year, the grade does uh, pick up. Uh, but yet again, you know, we, we will be able to treat 4 million tons, but still not the full average uh, grade. And that is why next year we can look at maybe 220 to 230,000 tons of um, MIC for, for Humsburg. I trust that answers the question and gives enough insight in terms of how we're looking at planning. Uh, we have a question on the audio audience. Uh, Maybe a, if you can touch upon the additional resource potential in Swartberg, Gagaru, and uh, uh, in terms of your phase two, etc., just to give a long-term trajectory, it will be good. So. Okay. So I think what's exciting about Zinc International and to the many analysts that uh, visited us, they saw this firsthand. You know, year on year, our reserve and resource has grown by over 30%. Uh, so we're now sitting at about 4 million tons more of zinc metal, just under 30 million tons of zinc metal um, equivalent in our resource base. What we've done outside of proving up our resources, you know, in the last year, we've also built confidence in terms of the project uh, pipeline. So the phase two project, which many of you will uh, remember on Humsburg, is a doubling up of the pit. So we go from 4 million tons to 8 million tons of ore. And then another module of the plant is in feasibility. And in the course of this uh, financial year, we'll be looking to approve that uh, project and hopefully start. Uh, Venkat, uh, as well as Arun, touched on the uh, zinc uh, refinery. That's work that we want to complete this year. Because, I mean, if you're in a high TC market, it's always best to be in, a, you know, in, a, in an industry where you are getting all of the benefit on uh, metal. So Sunil and myself are looking at that. But as Venkat said, you know, we might be looking at, um, you know, ramping down the Scorpion mine and the plant in the ne within the next 18 months. But there does remain a little bit of metal under PUT 112. We need to figure out how smartly and safely to get it out. And there, there is or there does remain a Gergerub uh, project, which is a JV with the neighboring uh, Trevally mine, uh, sulfide-based, uh, so we are looking at how we can um, exploit that. So I think as Venkat and the chairman like to say, at Zing International there continues to be sufficient water in the well, and the, the task for the coming year is to look at how quickly uh, we can get this into uh, production, into a uh, market. The thing as we are all seeing that, that this, this business continues to be the highest potential in terms of step change for the group. Thanks, Dishni. We have one question on the audio that we will take now. Thank you. That is from the line of Vineet Malu from Birla Sunrise. Please go ahead. Hi, good evening. Uh, my question is related to your aluminum segment. Uh, on the slide on aluminum profitability bridge uh, that is shown, uh, it seems that, uh, you know, the EBITDA per ton is $131 per ton. Uh, and your realization is about uh, 2000 
ten dollars or something. So I am not able to get to two thousand ten dollars. So it implies a cost of eighteen seventy odd, whereas in our cost numbers is shown a cost of seventeen seventy. So I'm just I'm I'm saying where is the difference? How do we reconcile this from the profitability bridge to the number that we have? Uh, you know, the actual number of seventeen seventy. Line wasn't awfully clear, but are you referring to the bridge uh, page or the general aluminium business model? I can throw a little bit light on the uh, general. So I'm, I'm on slide 42, uh, which shows aluminium profitability, where your total realization is $2,010 per turn, and your EBITDA per turn is $131. And if I find the difference between them is uh, it implied cost, which is about $1,870. Which is about a hundred dollars higher than our actual reported cost of seventeen seventy six odd. So I just wanted to reconcile the difference of about hundred dollars. I think uh, I think we do get your question, but we can come back. The IR team will come back to you offline on the exact reconciliation of the numbers. But broadly, uh, to uh, to make the point, I think uh, for uh, Ajay and the business is really about. The guidance that we've given at 1725 uh, odd, I think, is the guidance given in the appendix, which typically is hot metal. We've been conservative there, and uh, we also understand uh, that we always have a premium of about $200. And with increasing domestic share uh, this year, I think about three percentage points has gone up, uh, very much in the last two three months actually, as well as the fact that uh, the VAP percentage, value added percentage, is constantly going up. We exited last year at about 58% uh, and we are already clocking 60 plus at this point of time. So that could add another uh, $30 or so more to the uh, top line. So any uh, aluminum you take anywhere between 1750 to 1950 or an average in between LME, you add another 200 to 30 and uh, reduce 1750, 1775, that should be a conservative margin. I would say can we get to 350, 400 would be a nice uh, target. And what is the potential uh, of that business? Very easily 600. Because as we have always been articulating and uh, both Ajay and Venkat covered the bauxite supply, every ton of aluminum produced with bauxite gives us about $300 uh, benefit in the EBITDA, actually. So the more and more as we convert during the year, the cost should start gradually coming down. So uh, on a lighter note, I do hope Ajay has kept a lot of buffer in this guidance and he's going to beat it. Uh, but that's the direction of our aluminum business. Anything you want to add, Ajay? So I think you've almost stated everything. Uh, the building blocks are coal because last year we had to pay heavily when coal was not available. Thankfully, as was also mentioned by Venkat in his address, we have more than 10 days stock at all our sites. Uh, our linkage uh, and also our uh, assured supplies along with our own uh, Chotia block is now upwards of 70. Uh, we would target reaching uh, closer to run rate of 80, 85 end of the year. So that solves a big part of our cost. Second is alumina. Uh, where I already spoke about uh, 3 million run rate on the locally available uh, bauxite. And in addition, with EGA, we have a long-term uh, contract that should also further help us. So I think these are the two uh, big building blocks. Marketing uh, and sales is something what Arun already mentioned. Uh, we are wanting to increase our domestic, uh, which we can already say uh, see the run rate is much better, and also the value-added products. I think those are the building blocks. Thanks, Ajay. Indrajit, do you have a question? Hi, this is Indrajit from Goldman Sachs. Uh, I have two questions. First on aluminum. Uh, what is the status of procuring alumina from Nelco? Any update on that? So the matter is subdued is uh, High Court has appointed favorably now in our favor. Uh, it's under appeal at Supreme Court as of now. Sure, thanks. And on steel, uh, despite benchmark prices going down sequentially, our realizations have risen sharply. So what has contributed to that? On, on, on steel realizations, our realizations have increased sharply quarter over quarter despite benchmark prices going down. So what has contributed to that? So uh, one is the volume. Another is uh, the uh, uh, IBRM material. So input uh, cost has uh, gone down. And uh, the, uh, the coke prices also softened a bit. So in combination of the productivity uh, Product portfolio, I would say, has improved because 
over the time the pig iron uh, percentage has gone down so next year we have taken even a uh, you know the, the smaller target so the product port portfolio improvement ibrm prices internal efficiency coke prices so a combination of that has improved the market thanks anil yes mangal yaar you can take that Yeah, thanks. This is Sumangal from Kotak. Uh, two questions. One uh, on this 500 million dollar investment in Volcan. Uh, now we did this in search of better yields. Uh, in case uh, the yields uh, the, uh, appear to uh, still remain above market yield, do we are we open to increase this investment beyond the current 500 million dollars, or we are done with this uh, instrument? I'll answer that question. We are done with it, and that's what we said last time, and it stays there. A very quick uh, clarification on the previous question on aluminium. Page 25, the bars will talk about the hot metal cost in aluminium, and the exit mark was 1700. The average for the quarter was 1780-ish. Page 42 would talk about including conversion cost of 103. That gives you a reconciliation of 130 on uh, EBITDA margin, right? Thanks. just one small bookkeeping we've discontinued giving the bias credit so if you could disclose that we'll take your suggestion and uh, we'll definitely put in our footnotes uh, soon on that i mentioned last time uh, it's about a billion dollars so stays around that much there's no significant movement in the last almost four quarters i would say because just capital employed working capital employed sort of we have one more question on the audio line so you can take that Thank you. That is from the line of Abhishek Podar from HDFC Mutual Fund. Please go ahead. Uh, hi. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, first one is regarding the power cost in the aluminium segment. Uh, we are seeing a 20% decline. I think in 3Q you had reported a $793 per ton in the power cost, which has come down to $632. Uh, what has led to such a sharp decline in the power? Uh, it's basically coming from our uh, uh, no imports. Uh, earlier we didn't have coal, so we had to import power, which was at six rupees on an average. Uh, so I think that's been the key, uh, you know, factor. And as I mentioned, uh, our security from our linkage and other domestic sources, and also own mine Chotia, which almost went up to closer to 0.6 million uh, this year. I think that added to the uh, power cost. So how do we see the sourcing in FY20? Uh, FY20, I think uh, the direction is what we did the uh, last quarter. Uh, we should actually do better than that. So imports will be minimal in that case. Yeah, and if we can just help you with a couple of uh, data points, I think uh, we exceeded, uh, we exited the year with uh, almost two thirds of linkage percentage, and uh, thanks to the fourth round of uh, coal linkage auctions, which we started realizing in fourth quarter, uh, plus the fact that uh, you remember we had bid and won a mine in Balco Chotia that started producing. So you'll have a full year impact of both of this. as well as a fifth round of auction scheduled for august 19 so structurally coal uh, 3/4 perhaps uh, linkage security as ajay elucidated and the balance would be spot and imports if required but then uh, they become very small uh, balcos almost reach a design level of around 5 565 dollars in quarter 4 as exited so pretty much a nice stick for balco okay and the last question is uh, regarding the uh, net debt breakup that you are given in slide 34 of the presentation uh, there is one item uh, in uh, kin india holdings where the net cash has uh, gone up uh, from 38 billion in uh, previous quarter to 57 billion uh, what has led to that increase so kin india holdings is a operating entity uh, at the end of the day and uh, half of the kin business you recollect sits in that so uh, exact reconciliation i'm sure the team can uh, get back but uh, broadly um, i mean it's a nice question to have why is it going up it will go up Uh, the output is coming and uh, the profit petroleum is going up there so it does gone up in quarter 4 and as i mentioned earlier that includes the investment that we have made uh, which is roughly around 270 uh, 270 million or 2000 crores approximately there included in cash and cash equivalents okay thank you thank you i now hand the conference back to ms rashmi mohanty thank you we again have a follow up question so we can just Uh, 
end of the day, the linkage supply is dependent on Coal India uh, basically meeting uh, its commitment, right? So to that extent, if you have a repeat of the first half of 2019 where the power demand shoots up and Coal India lags, uh, then the cost guidance would again come under stress, uh, right? I mean, the linkages wouldn't matter. That would be a fair assumption? I think you have already said the answer in your question. Yes. This volatility is uh, very, very, uh, you know, severe. But when I meet the people and I talk to, Coal India did a very ever highest production this year at 7%. Uh, I think they're also uh, well geared to go ahead. If you see overall coal stocks in the country, across sectors, I'm coming from cement, and I, we were suffering there as well, but I hear now that uh, there's a sufficient amount of coal available. So the risk remains, uh, but I think uh, it also happened because at one stage the government also went more for domestic at the cost of imported. You know that whole story. Uh, now, I think that that mistake perhaps will not be committed. So, I, I'm more confident, more bullish on coal supply. So, given your experience of cement, uh, if Petco consumption keeps on coming down uh, and uh, cement has been on Petco for so many years and they're forced to go to coal, does that tighten the situation further or cement that is a, great? Cement is a very small pie of the, you know, we buy in, uh, in, in aluminium alone close to 60,000 tons of coal every day. I mean, that's not the kind of a coal a cement sector can buy. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us here in person on the webcast and on the audio call as well. As always, if there are any follow-up questions, uh, we are available. The IR team is here and you can reach out to us. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.